Anybody? Does anybody like uh, bulletin bloopers? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> so Victoria sent me a bulletin blooper this week. Uh, and it, it read something like this. In the Family Life Center, the crackpots will be led by Pastor Don. <laughs> I think she deliberately set it up that way uh, to, to do it. And then uh, she eliminated it, changed it around. Okay, so I got to put this that we've got it. So <clears throat> I'd like for us to begin. We're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Today we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. And so uh, I like to title this Crackpot Ministry. So uh, I think that we're, I'd like for us to start off with singing, okay? So we'll lift high the cross. Can we see that all right? Or do we need to have it, uh, the, the heavy lights? Shall we dim them down? Okay. Do you want to start us off here, Mark? And we'll join in with you, okay? Lift high the cross. The love of Christ proclaim till all the world adore his sacred name. Come, Christians, follow where our captain trod, our king victorious. Christ, the Son of God, lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Let every race and every language tell of him who saves our lives from death and hell. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Thank you for leading us in that, Mark. That we begin, make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pastor and family are out of town this week. Okay, so where do we go here? Is that it? On my slides? Okay, pastor and uh, family are out of town, and uh, we'll see about getting this thing up. No? Okay, here it comes. Now it's working. I don't know what happened. It's being slow today, but let's join in the prayer if we would. Okay. Oh, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see, my ears to hear, my mind to understand, my heart to know you, and my lips, hands, and feet to follow you. In the name of Jesus, amen. And let's see how long it takes this one time. Okay. Eventually it's going to come, will it? The computer is very slow today. So let's see if something else can happen here. Okay, it's the mission statement. Activated by the Holy Spirit, we glorify God through worship, word, witness, and work so that all people can be transformed and devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And it looks like I shut everything down. Okay, so we're going to bring that back up. You should have some discussion sheets at your table. And so uh, let's start off with table talk real quickly. Yeah. At your table, uh, using this discussion, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the success of the gospel in our world today? And if you want to get a different tables to join a little bit bigger, that's fine. Uh, Larry, uh, you're, you're confident, you're 
uh, you might want to get to it. <laughs> okay, to join in. But on a, on a, we're going to take just a few minutes of this. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the success of the gospel in our world today? And how would you, why do you rate it as you do? And how does your rating affect your actions? And then also, how would you rate the success of St. Paul and why? So we're going to do that in about four minutes. Okay, so you better have at it. Okay. <laughs> Okay. What's that? A little more time. We got other things we got to talk about. This is just the introduction. <laughs> How many gave it a 10? Anybody give it a 10? Okay. So, all right. Well, what about, uh, how would you rate St. Paul's success? How do you think St. Paul rated his success? Yeah. It, that, it seemed like a failure. It seemed like a failure. Because that's what we're going to go into in regard to this particular, and that's why also, we also call this crackpot ministry. Because it goes to do in the uh, treasure of uh, clay jars uh, that he gets into in the next section. But we want to focus on several of the verses here and take a look and see what was going on. <clears throat> And so do we have somebody who would read the first two verses for us? Um, okay, here. Uh, this is the Christian Standard Bible. Mm -hmm. Therefore, since we have this ministry because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. Okay. Scriptures are very realistic. St. Paul's very realistic as he takes a look at what's going on in his, in his ministry. At this particular time, he had been in Corinth for a year and a half with uh, Silas and Timothy. They had done great work. They were the first ones to bring the message of the Christ to Corinth, which was the sin city of the empire at that time, and great things happened through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
St. Paul then goes away and starts uh, doing some other things. And in the meantime, some other groups of people come in <clears throat> who claim to be apostles, and they start uh, saying, well, uh, St. Paul really didn't give you the mess the gospel message straight. Uh, he gave it to you in a diluted form. Uh, he was humble, and that showed you that uh, his message was too weak. Uh, what you need is powerful super apostles like us who are going to lord it over you. And St. Paul came in and gave it freely because he knew that his gospel was of no value. But we're going to give you the valuable gospel, so we're going to charge you for giving you the gospel. And people started believing him. So for a year and a half, he has been, um, for a year and a half, they invested a year and a half of their lives in ministry in this congregation. And now it seems like they're throwing it all away. Congregations throw it all away. So St. Paul is very realistic. He knows that the gospel has been rejected by many of God's people, including the Jewish people that have been given the promise of the Messiah over the years. But here's the point. St. Paul always goes back to the understanding that God in his mercy has given the gospel free of charge. The gospel of Christ Jesus. And not only in his mercy has God given the gospel, he has also given the gospel ministry out of his mercy. And so what we could do is point to somebody at your table with a good index finger and point at him and say, God chose you to be his minister. I don't know why, but <laughs> so this is this is basically what is going on. So so having that as a formation stone uh, for what he is going to be he's talking about in the rest of this chapter, then he said there are a lot of people rejecting the gospel, but it is still the gospel of God. So then, having that understanding, what does St. Paul decide, tell us very clearly he is not going to do? He is not going to do. He said, I'm not going to give up. Uh, how many were in service, the first service this morning? We heard that message. Don't give up. Keep sowing the seed. Don't give up. So St. Paul says, I'm not going to give up no matter how bad the situation seems, nor am I going to give in. And uh, what he could do is give in to dishonesty. He could uh, begin to do things uh, in a way uh, that would uh, hopefully make the gospel attractive to people in such a way that uh, they would go ahead and readily receive it, but they would do it dishonest as far as what he is proclaiming. Also, he decides that he's not going to do any kind of dishonesty, nor is he going to use secret and shameful ways. The word secret here infers to covering up their real motives. So he's not going to go out and proclaim the gospel simply because and make it as easy to receive as possible so that we get more members to pay off our church debt. But the real motive is paying off our church debt rather than sharing the gospel. He's not going to go to any kind of shameful stuff like that or secret thing nor is he going to any shameful things. And the word shameful here uh, infers that they were doing things for their selfish gain. So he wasn't going to play some kind of gospel message giving in order to make money for himself to bring in more income. Nor is he going to use deceptive ways. And the deceptive ways then actually comes from the deceiver. What is one of the titles that is given to Satan? The deceiver. The deceiver. And so St. Paul says, in no way am I going to try to share the gospel in a way that it is deceptive or deceiving people. That is not the way of the gospel. 
That's not the way of the gospel. That is not to be the way of the gospel messenger. And then he comes down to another part, nor am I going to distort the gospel. I'm not going to distort the gospel. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to change it. Uh, because it is a gospel of mercy that was given to me out of mercy, out of God's mercy to share freely. And so he's not going to distort the gospel because it is the word of God. The gospel is the word of God. Now, I have to understand, 2,000 years ago, among the Jewish people, what was the word of God? The Old Testament. The Old Testament was the word of God. And there was no equal. At least there wasn't supposed to be. Um, but there was not supposed to be an equal to the Old Testament to the word of God. So here St. Paul is very clearly saying the gospel is the word of God. It is equal to <clears throat> the Old Testament. And that's why uh, at the end of the gospel reading, uh, you know, we say, this is the word of the Lord. And everybody responds, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We don't say that when we're talking in here and we're just having conversation about whether it was red or green combines that were collecting wheat. We don't say, well, this is a word of the Lord. You know, thanks be to God. No, the emphasis is upon the word of God, the word of God. So then <clears throat> after St. Paul says what he will not do, then he goes into what he is going to do. He is going to continue to make the gospel as transparent as possible. We think transparency is a political term that's devised by political leaders in the last 20 years. It's nonsense. St. Paul uses the term uh, in a little bit different way, but he's talking about transparency. He said, I'm going to make it when I make a when I bring the gospel message, I want to bring it as clear as possible. And so he speaks of the, the transparency of the truth. And he wants to make it so clear and understandable so that nobody can with good conscience say, I didn't understand what he was talking about. He wanted, didn't want anybody to ever reject the gospel because uh, they could use the excuse uh, that it wasn't clear enough stated, wasn't cl stated clearly enough. And uh, he also says that he wants to make the gospel clear in his presentation of the gospel as clear as possible because it's always under God's examination. It's always under God's examination. We might say, uh, it's always under God's microscope because the word that's used in the Greek here emphasizes looking at something in full sunlight so that you get as clear a picture as you possibly can. And so St. Paul then uh, emphasizes these are the things that he is going, not going to do and these are the things that he is going to do. And uh, all because the gospel is given by the mercy of God and the ministry of the gospel is also given by the mercy of God. And they definitely have that uh, in place. So this is the first segment as he goes in to this particular part of his letter. Any comments or questions or just real quickly on these particular thoughts or verses? Good. Well, let's go to the next law, gospel, faith, and action. The law shows us our sin, our need for a savior. The gospel shows us that Jesus is our savior. Our Christian life shows us how God, the Holy Spirit, is leading us to live. So, in this particular verses that we just read, are there any examples of law? Any examples of law? You know, examples of law, I think, are very clearly shown in uh, what he says he's not going to do in deception. You know, that's part of the law in uh, changing the truth, distorting the word. Those are the kinds of things he's simply not going to do. The gospel is shown in that 
The gospel is freely given by the mercy of God. Freely given by the mercy of God. And then St. Paul then, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Christian life, uh, is shown in the verses that St. Paul talks about. He is going to make the gospel available as clearly as he possibly can so that more and more people can understand it. So with those things in mind, I'd like to first get back to our tables then. Uh, because of our time constraint, let's take a, look, take a look at two and three and four. The more confidence we have that the mission belongs to God, the more confident we are that it will not fail. Maybe explain how that is true. Why is it tempting to sugarcoat the gospel? And how would you state the gospel as plainly and clearly as possible? We'll give you, Willard, how about five minutes on this one? Okay. <laughs> so why don't, you, why don't we take off on this and, uh, and discuss those particular items, uh, especially uh, two through four, okay? You want to do it as, I'm sorry? Okay. Jane suggested doing it as a group. All in favor say aye. Opposed, same sign. Aye. <laughs> okay. So the more confident, we'll do it all together. The more confidence we have that the mission belongs to God, the more confident we are that it will not fail. Explain. What is that saying? Jane, just a minute for our microphone, please. The scripture says that God says, my word will not re return to me void. He promises that it will serve his purposes. Right. The Old Testament lesson for today. So, any other thoughts? Julie. I <laughs> God just doesn't fail. I mean, he doesn't. Right. What he wants to have happen will happen. That's just a fact. <laughs> okay. Pastor Barr, give some exercise here. In the early 80s, I had the uh, experience in Penn County of a little church in town that was uh, not satisfactory for, for worship and it wasn't had, didn't have a future. And uh, they had already had the idea of a building program. But all along the way, there were people that were saying, we can't do that. We can't do that. We're going to move and we're going to build a whole new church. We're gonna do that. We had one member by the name of Dan Miles, <laughs> uh, who's in heaven now, but uh, died very young. But he would always stand up and say, if it's God's will, we'll be able to do it. Don't, don't talk like that you know? uh -huh. and and he managed to, to pull the whole church behind that idea and and it just turned out beautifully uh -huh. when we share the gospel where's the power god's fulfillment god's fulfillment and uh, and so that is uh that's why saint paul uh, outlines the things that he does we get discouraged, and so one in our discouragement, we give up. Uh, St. Paul says, no, we don't give up because God keeps his word. God keeps his word. Uh, why is it tempting to sugarcoat the gospel? What would be an example of sugar? Uh, I'll go ahead, Kent. And then if somebody want to give an example of sugarcoating the gospel. People don't want to hear that they're sinners. People don't want to hear that they're sinful. Kathy? All, all people will go to heaven, just different roads. Okay, all people will go to heaven, so it's just different roads. And Jesus is one of the, one of the ways. And uh, if it's convenient for you to follow him, then follow him. But if there are others that you want to follow, go ahead and follow that. That's sugarcoating or dumbing down the gospel. Today, so many people um, need to be entertained and, and drawn in by the amazing and the 
you know, and, and the gospel just isn't as exciting as it needs to be for some people or, or even to um, um, draw other people. They think they have to be, you know, make it bigger than life. Okay. So some, finding some way to uh, not just to draw in. There's a, one, there's a difference between opening a door for people to come in but uh, and then then to uh, changing the message, you know we find we try to find more and more open doors for people to come in uh, and experience uh, hear the word or the, the gospel. So um, how would you state the gospel as plainly and clearly as possible? Um, most has done a great job with their little witness bracelets. It has the beads of the different colors, and uh, it goes over pretty well in Tanzania as well as here. Yeah. So the, the most has that bead bracelet, which is a an object lesson as well as explaining the gospel. <clears throat> How would you? Now this one, I think we ought to take a little time to think about. Okay. How would you state the gospel as clearly and as possible, as plainly as possible? In a minute. John 3, 16. Uh, God created me and gave me life, and he created you and gave you life, and you're valuable to him. But we messed it up. And we can't correct it on our own. God gave a Savior, His Son, Jesus. In Him, we have forgiveness, absolute assurance of eternal life. And God wants us to live with confidence that He will always love us, always forgive us, always give us eternal life, all because of His Son, Jesus. I'd like to add uh, John 3.17. To add John 3.17. Right. Okay. <clears throat> There are ways to clearly state the gospel, to clearly state the gospel. So once we clearly state the gospel, then everybody gets it, right? So let's see what St. Paul says about that as we continue to crack pot ministry. So how about uh, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 3 through 3 and 4, just 3 and 4, okay? And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay. So, so what's the result of proclaiming the name of Christ Jesus very clearly? Going to have some people that is veiled too. And he actually speaks about the veiled gospel. But it's very, very clear. It's not the gospel that is veiled because he is making the presentation as clearly as he possibly can. So why is it veiled? Why do people have this veil? He, he had referred in a previous chapter to the veil that hung over Moses' face after he met with God. And he's using that as a, as a takeoff thing. Today we say, why do people have cataracts? Why do people have spiritual cataracts that make them refuse to see the clear message of the gospel? St. Paul outlines this one. One, we're all perishing people. Anybody in here a perishing person? You know, we're all sinful people. Sinful people reject God's working. That's the way it is. Sinful people reject God's working and not only that the God of this age so who would be the God of this age Satan notice it doesn't say the God of the universe Satan is not the God of the universe he may be a lord over particular ages or time frames within history but he is never God over all so the lord of this age the God of this age has blinded people with scales on their eyes. Has blinded people with scales on their eyes. So who's writing these words? 
in this letter? St. Paul, do you think he's got any background to this? Yeah. So what was his what was his background? When he heard the message of Christ, his first reaction was kill him. Kill him. Heresy. This is terrible. This is not going to be. He fought against it. And finally, then, um, the Lord Jesus, the risen Savior, uh, blinded him. And then when the message of the gospel was brought to him by Ananias, can you imagine being Ananias and uh, being sent to, uh, to witness to Saul, who had been sent there to arrest Ananias? No. Oh. And after Ananias gave, spoke the gospel to him plainly, clearly, he was baptized, he was believed. And then it states there was something like scales that fell from his eyes. So now it became clear. So, okay, so the, that's, uh, that's what, the, what has happened. So what's the results of veiled eyes? St. Paul continues on. Results of veiled eyes, and he's drawing from personal experience. Can't see. You can't see. You cannot see the light of the gospel. You can't see what God is doing to bring light into the darkness of your life. You can't see the glory of Christ. And the word for glory here uh, is a Shekinah in the Old Testament. It is the inner presence of God. This is God's makeup might say this is his character his total character this glory this glory of his love and his mercy and his creating ability and his redeeming love all of that that is so so much a part of the innermost part of god and that glory is all seen in christ jesus who is the true image of god now saint paul couldn't see that Saul couldn't see that. Should play. Saul could not see that uh, because of his rejection, uh, because the God of the age had distorted his image. But now he sees clearly the true image of God, the true image of God. And so in this particular aspect, then, St. Paul speaks about the reality of the gospel being veiled in our world and also the reality that god continues to give his life uh, and his light so let's go to some more questions in here what is it about the gospel that makes it seem so untrue and so unreliable what is it about the gospel that makes it seem so untrue and so unreliable. I think for some people, because we're saying that you have to know Jesus, they think that's a narrow road. And they think there's so many other people that are going to perish that it's a narrow road and they have a hard time accepting that. Okay. Wait. It, for me, it was that I couldn't believe that anyone could love me that much, that they would actually give up their life for me. And that was the hardest part about fully understanding the gospel. All right. It's hard to comprehend a love that great by someone so great. As Pastor Tom, I think, has said many times, it's not reasonable from human, you know, from our point of view. It doesn't seem like, like you said, you know, someone who is so far above us in terms of holiness and power and, and deserving of glory would bother with us. Yeah. It's already all been done. That's um, we don't do anything. We're not in control of that somehow. Right. That the good and bad, what I do on a daily basis, it's um, 
that doesn't earn my salvation. Right. The fact that we cannot earn our salvation. We simply cannot earn our salvation. I think to most of the world, it seems, seems unreasonable for the virgin birth and the resurrection. Yeah. And creation and the flood. Right. And, I mean, everything. It just all seems too much. Right. Can you think of a time when God had to remove your spiritual cataracts? Uh, in Oklahoma, it was quite common among the uh, uh, Christians there who were coming from a um, uh, believer's back baptism and a um, uh, you have to make a decision in order to be you're a Christian because you made a decision uh, about that. Uh, and quite often those were tied with specific very powerful events that took place in a person's life. You know, and they very often they would describe, well, such and such was happening and all of a sudden, boom, I, I came, to, I turned my life over to Christ Jesus, which is very, very good. But I didn't have any experiences like that because I had the unfortunate experience of being brought into the family of God when I was 13 days old in holy baptism. And I grew up my whole life understanding God loves me. I'm a part of God's family. Isn't that a terrible thing to have to experience? Yeah. You know, so anyhow, I was at a disadvantage that way. But there were many times as I look back over my life that God kind of took the spiritual cataracts off and to help me understand God really does love me. His gift of eternal life really is for me. And those are times in taking the spiritual cataracts off of our eyes so that the gospel message soaks into us so that I can have a more and, and respond then, thank you, God, for letting, giving me this understanding of the power of your Holy Spirit so that, uh, so that I really understand a better understanding of your love for me. And of course, we're never going to get that full understanding in this life never will so uh too immense to understand okay let's take a look at actually it should be verses five and six we we'll take a look at verses five and six then well what we proclaim is not ourselves but jesus christ our lord with ourselves as your servants for jesus sake for god who said let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay. St. Paul makes it very, very clear that his understanding of himself and his ministry, uh, this is one of the key parts. The gospel is always about the message, not the messenger. As soon as the gospel becomes about the messenger, then we're distorting the message. The focus, uh, as Pastor Paul Z and Pastor Tom <clears throat> always are pointing us to Jesus, pointing us to Jesus. And so St. Paul says very, very clearly, this is what his intention always has been. And once you do that, when you focus upon the message, the message basically is Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. It's one of the first uh, creeds of the, of the scripture, of the uh, Christian church. And uh, it became a life and death statement. It was used by the Roman authorities uh, as a way to determine whether they're going to put somebody to death or not. Do you, can you say that Caesar is God over all, even over your Jesus? And if not, then it's the death penalty, you're executed. So this became a statement that caused, uh, brought about the deaths of a lot of God's people uh, in the uh, first 300 years 
uh, after uh, AD. So the emphasis is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And then St. Paul makes this uh, statement. I think this is a, is a key to in sharing uh, the gospel message. Jesus is Lord, and we are servants. Whose servants? Your servants. Now, that's not what we would expect St. Paul to say. Jesus is Lord, and we are his servants. Why would St. Paul say, Jesus is Lord, and we are your servants? Why would he make that kind, use that particular pronoun instead of the Lord's servants? When we bring the message to others, we come as their servants. We are serving them free gospel message. And so St. Paul says, I want you to reflect, ask the Corinthians, are you, uh, uh, you think about my ministry when I came there, when we were there and how we acted. Uh, we were coming with, in the name of the Lord, but we were coming as your servants. Uh, so that in all things, it would be for the sake of Jesus. So that all things would be for the sake of Jesus. And continues on, or he makes a reference to God proclaim, let there be light. And when is this, of course? Creation. In the, in the midst of the chaos and the darkness and uh, the unformed, uh, God's first statement of creation is, let there be light. Chasing away the darkness. Chasing away the darkness. And then the Holy Spirit says the same thing. Let there be light in our hearts. He comes out and says, I want to give you, I want to bring light into your heart. I want to bring light into your heart. What did you sing last Sunday? Praise team, the closing hymn. Shine, Jesus, shine. Shine, Jesus, shine. You know, shine in our hearts, shine in our lives. And so as St. Paul says then this, as we we're always trying to do so that What's going to shine in our hearts? What's going to shine in our lives? It's going to be the face of God. The face of God shining in our lives through the face of Jesus. Where do we find the best example of God in all of history? In the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus. You cannot get a better picture of who God is than we see in the person of Jesus. He is God. That's exactly it. He is the full image of God. Human being and yet truly God. So, um, the God who created and called out light into existence and call this earth into existence, then is the one who also brings the light into our lives. So this gets back to the veiled gospel. The veiled gospel. The gospel is veiled because we are sinful people who have cataracts and can't see it. So how are those cataracts removed? You ever see a surgeon remove his own cataracts? Don't think that happens. I've never seen an open heart surgeon perform open heart surgery on himself or herself. Doesn't happen. It's got to be somebody else. It's got to be somebody else. And so the only way that we have come to faith is through the power of the Holy Spirit who brings this light into our lives so that finally we can say, aha, now I'm beginning to understand what this gospel message is all about. What this gospel message is all about. So, um, as we think about this, then, 
uh, sometimes it might speak of that the gospel is both plain and glorious. What do you think that might refer to? The gospel is both plain and glorious. If, uh, plain means just plain spoken. Um, of course, it's glorious, but just straightforward, plain spoken, I think. Okay. It is straight and uh, similar to uh, what did Martin Luther say when uh, he was asked at the uh, uh, diet of worms, you know, uh, on, uh, so well, you want an answer? I'll give it to you without horns or teeth. But in other words, I'll give you a straight answer. I'm not going to recant. Uh, and so it, this is a, a straight answer, a, a plainness of the gospel. Okay. I was just going to say that it's, pretty simple and we overcomplicate things. I know I over complicate things every day. And when you just get to the word and you look at it, it's very simply laid out. And how amazing is that, that we don't have to overcomplicate it. Right. Uh, so the message is given to us and we say, uh, but God, <laughs> and he's no, no, no. Let's go back to what did I say? This is, this is, what is for you? So the confidence that uh, God gives us that you are you are forgiven. We are forgiven. We are forgiven of every sin we've ever done. Got any that you can think of <laughs> that you wish you knew for sure were forgiven? And so thankful that God indeed emphasizes those are indeed forgiven. And we can come up with all kinds of things. Uh, to try to uh, make it more difficult for us to believe and understand. Uh, so what is you, as St. Paul talks about, the face of Jesus is showing us the face of God. Uh, what does the face of Jesus show us about God? What is the face of Jesus? What is it that looking at Jesus and having a clear understanding of him, what is he, what is that telling us about God, the Almighty God Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? That He's a loving God. A loving God. And He's a serving God. He came not to be served, but to serve. Do you think that it had, he's referring to the fact that scripture says God, no one has ever seen God's face, and this is Jesus who is God, so we've seen his face? Right. Yeah, it definitely flows, is very strong connection to that particular emphasis uh, that uh, uh, no one sees the face of God and lives because of his holiness. And here, God sends us himself in person so that we can see his face uh, and see that love and compassion and forgiveness. The face of Jesus is in my imagination is he's on the cross and he's dying and he looks at me and says, Mark, this is for you. Powerful. Right. The face of Jesus emphasizing to whatever he has done, he has done for us. As Saint, as uh, I was going to say, well, as St. Thomas said this morning in the first service, <laughs> uh, now I forgot what I was going to say he said. So, <laughs> oh, so uh, I'll think of it later. I'll call you three in the morning, let you know what it was, okay? How can we receive the most help when Satan is trying to veil the gospel to us and to others? Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. No. Understanding that we cannot understand, uh, uh, realizing that we cannot understand the gospel message clearly without the Holy Spirit, 
So that means we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand. We need to ask and pray and beg the Holy Spirit to help us understand as clearly as possible uh, the message of the gospel, uh, that we are forgiven, that this is what we have done for us. Now I remember, Mark, you know, Pastor Tom said he can't answer the why question, but he can't answer the what question. What has God done for us? And Jesus said, this is what I've done for you. This is what I've done for you. Okay, so uh, in a, just a few moments, I'd like for you to take a time uh, for yourselves to do some thinking and uh, for you to just kind of uh, reflect upon uh, the result of taking a look at these Bible passages uh, being in the Word of God. What is the Holy Spirit calling me to believe? And is there something he is calling me to do? Just to take a few moments of time to think about that. Uh, and if you want to jot them down, that is great. If you want to jot them down in your mind, uh, do it that way as well. Okay, why don't we close our session with uh, uh, Martin Luther's morning prayer. I'd like for us to all join together in praying. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Thank you so very much. And we're going to end the Zoom now. What do I have to do now, Mark? Tell me what I got to do. <laughs>